Season 2 of the Monster series, which Netflix launched after the unexpected success of the Dharma series, was recently released, and this time round, instead of following a lone serial killer, this one focused on the two brothers that murdered their mother and father in Beverly Hills in 1989, Lyle and Derek Menendez. There's always been a lot of talking points around their trial due to the fact that nobody truly knew who to believe and what their actual motive was in killing their parents. With the killers leaning into abuse from their parents as motive, and the fact that they felt like their father was going to kill them, but the only people that would be able to confirm or deny that being in the ground, and the prosecutors leaning into the brothers looking to get financial gain from their parents' deaths. This whole series was centered around the different stories that were being told, the different perspectives, and giving the illusion of confusion to the viewer in allowing us to make up our own mind like the jury on what we could believe. But just how accurate was what was being depicted on screen? Well, let's take a look at the show and the real-life case, trial and sentencing, and even what occurred in prison and compare the two. Here is a video on how accurate was the Lyle and Eric Menendez Netflix show. One of the first small details that was included in the show that I feel I have to mention occurred in the opening couple of moments, and this was a small nod to the fact that Lyle was wearing his dead father's shoes. In a documentary that was released about the Menendez brothers, it was actually said that one of the brothers was wearing his father's shoes, and during a speech he was giving, he said, My father always said I'd never be able to fill his shoes. Guess what? I'm wearing my father's shoes today. So the fact that there was a nod to that in the first few moments of the show was something that made me feel like this was going to be paying attention to the finest of details. The killing of Jose and Kitty and the immediate aftermath. When it came to the killing of Jose and Kitty Menendez, it was said that during the night that they were killed, it was carried out with a Mossberg 12-gauge shotgun. Kitty was said to have been shot 10 times before she was killed with the fatal shot in her cheek, and she was also moving and still alive when Lyle went to the car to reload one final time before finishing her off as the show put it. It's said that Jose was shot 6 times. Like in the show, following the brothers murdering their parents, they then drove up Mulholland Drive where they disposed of their weapons before going to the cinema and buying tickets as part of their alibi. They did this because they expected the police to have been called due to the neighbours hearing gunshots, but because there were no authorities there when they arrived back home, that's when they had to make the phone call. This is why nobody's here was uttered by the brothers when they parked up on the drive, because they didn't expect it to be empty. One of the fatal errors that the police made, which was addressed in the show, was the fact that the brothers weren't tested for gunshot residue on the night of the murders. This is because they weren't initially deemed to be suspects, and because they said how it could have been the Mafia. That was the main thing that the police were investigating at the start. When the police started to become suspicious that it could well have been the brothers due to the financial gain that they were set to inherit upon both of their parents' deaths, and the strange behavior of spending nearly $700,000 in a short amount of time, like in the show, we saw the police working with Eric's close friend Craig with the hopes of getting a confession out of him. However, Eric denied it all when questioned. This apparently happened before Eric confessed it all to Dr. Azil, unlike in the show where we saw the confession first and the events then be shaped around it. Events preceding the killings, such as Eric going off to other countries and playing tennis, Lyle buying a Rolex and opening up a Buffalo Wing restaurant in Princeton, and also getting a Porsche whilst they stayed in a completely different condo was all true as well. One thing that wasn't included, which has become somewhat memorable, is following the death of their parents and during this spending spree, they attended a New York Knicks basketball game and they actually appeared in the background of the Mark Jackson trading card as they were courtside. One thing that was slightly different once the brothers were arrested was the fact that they weren't initially placed in the same jail as each other. They were kept completely separate, whereas in this show, they were together for a lot of the time. Dr. Azil's Tapes Dr. Azil's tapes and the reason that the brothers ultimately ended up being apprehended was somewhat similar to what occurred in the show. Eric did confess to his psychiatrist and once the doctor told Judalon what he'd heard, once Judalon and Dr. Azil broke up, she went to the police and informed them of all of the tapes that they'd recorded during the sessions, ultimately leading to Lyle's arrest and Eric to turn himself in when he returned to LA. Within real life, there were actually a lot of legal battles over the tapes and decisions over whether or not they could be used in court, something we didn't see happening in the show, but eventually the California Supreme Court decided that they could be used as evidence. The Trial 
The trial was where the show felt like it really came into its own. I feel like this was a show of three thirds. The first three episodes were really strong. The middle three felt a bit like a repeat of the first three, but I feel like that was done to give the sense of confusion. And then the final three were probably the strongest because it was the trial. And during this, we saw just how sociopathic the brothers were. And we saw them go from being loved by the people and actually splitting opinions to the tides turning and them coming to the realization that they could well be facing the death penalty. One of the main faces in the trial was defense attorney Leslie Abramson, and she was actually the person who represented Eric Menendez throughout both trials that took place. They mentioned the case of Arnel Salvatierra, who was the boy that killed his father that she managed to get to manslaughter with a sentence of probation instead of first-degree murder, and that is actually correct. Within the show, we saw that Leslie pushed for the root of the fact that the brothers were abused by their father and that their mother sat by and watched it happen. The only people that could corroborate that story were two cousins, which we saw being portrayed in the show, Cousin Andy and also Cousin Diana. This was the case in the real-life trial as well. This is what ultimately caused opinions to be split, not only amongst the Menendez family, but also the jury, which eventually went on to be a deadlocked one. Something which we did see happen in the show. Plus, the photograph that was used as evidence in the trial to back up the claim that Jose was an abuser was something that did also exist. The claim that the brothers felt like Jose was going to kill them if they didn't keep the abuse a secret was something that the defense was built upon in the show, and that they killed first so that they wouldn't be killed, and that was the case in the actual trial that took place. However, the prosecution failed to believe that that was the motive, and it was mainly centered around the financial gain that they were set to inherit. One thing that wasn't mentioned in the show but did actually occur during the trial from the prosecution was that Pam Bosanich argued that men could not be abused because they lack the necessary equipment for it to take place, whatever that means. When it came to the retrial, it was considerably less publicized due to the fact that the judge didn't allow the courtroom to be filmed. Within the show, it mentioned how the book that was published went against Lyle, and that book by Norma was actually released and is available to buy, which is the private conversations that she had with Lyle Menendez whilst he was in jail, and also the fact that the tides had turned due to the injustices that were felt throughout the city with regards to the riots and the OJ case. So the public sentiment definitely did change by the second trial. When it came to the sentencing, both of the brothers were convicted on two counts of first-degree murder and conspiracy to murder, and were given life in prison without the chance of parole. Whilst in the deliberation room, it was made out like the abuse was taken into consideration by the jury when not going for the death penalty. However, that wasn't actually the case at all. It was actually said that it wasn't taken into consideration at all, and the only reason that they did not receive the death penalty was because they had no previous criminal record or previous record of violent behavior. With regards to Eric being on trial, him speaking too close to the mic and being told to sit back, that was something that did occur when he actually took the stand. Did Eric Menendez meet O.J. Simpson? One moment that came as a surprise in the show was when the infamous O.J. Simpson car chase was shown on screen, and then O.J. ended up in a cell next to Eric Menendez. This was something that did actually happen. The two were in neighboring cells to one another whilst Eric was preparing for the retrial. It's said that the two shared over 100 conversations between each other as they were waiting for meetings with their legal representatives in the attorney's room in the jail. It was also said that Eric was offering OJ advice throughout their time due to him being in jail for around four years by that point. Hence why in the show we heard him say that he should consider a plea and admit his guilt. OJ getting found not guilty was something that the brothers felt contributed to the public opinion changing on them. OJ's case sent ripples through the city that some kind of injustice had been served, so the public were after blood and they couldn't allow two potential killers to walk free. Hence why during that second trial, it didn't feel like they were as loved as what they once were. They'd fallen out of fashion or favor. Dominic Dunn Dominic Dunn was portrayed in this show and he almost acted like us in the series. The person whose mind was swaying from side to side and not truly knowing what to believe. He was almost like the voice of reason. However, he had a natural distaste towards Leslie and defense attorneys due to his daughter Dominique being killed by a man called John Sweeney, and the jury not finding him guilty of murder, but instead manslaughter, where he only received six years in prison, but he got out after two and a half years. Following his sentence, he did actually go to work at a restaurant in Santa Monica, like was said in the show. But following people finding out his identity and the Dunn family protesting outside and informing customers that their meal had been cooked by a murderer, he quit his job and moved out of the city. As well as that, the article which was titled Nightmare on Elm Drive was actually published by Dominic in Vanity Fair. The Menendez Brothers' Prison Life 
There was something about the ending of the show where the last time that the brothers got a glimpse of one another, being in the back of a van as they were getting separated and sent to two completely different prisons, it just hit hard. Two brothers that had such a deep-rooted connection and killed their parents, not only for themselves but for each other, had to face the rest of their lives without one another, which felt like an added layer to the punishment. Within real life, whilst in prison, they were kept separate from other inmates because they were deemed to be maximum security prisoners. The brothers were kept separated from their incarceration in 1996 up until April 2018, where two months prior they were moved to the same prison, but in April they were reunited for the first time in 22 years. From the information that I've seen, it seems like this show was relatively accurate with the story that it told. Plus, it also showed different perspectives of the night in question, the build-up to the murder, and the life of the family based on different accounts, because there's always been confusion around what actually occurred on that night and what the family was like. There was quite a powerful line that was within this show, and it was, we're never going to know what happened in that family. And I truly think that's the case, because we only really have one side to listen to. When it comes to both of the seasons in the monster show that have been released, I would have to say that I found the Dharma one to be extremely chilling and haunting, and just a little bit more gripping when watching. But I don't think that means that this one is bad at all, it's just maybe not 100% what I was expecting. Apparently the next one's going to be focused on John Wayne Gacy, and I can't help but feel like that one's going to be extremely dark. So, there you have it, was the Lyle and Eric Menendez Netflix show accurate? If you want to see videos on Season 1 of Monsters, which was focused on Dharma, then click on the card in the top corner. I'll also be delving into other parts of this show, so feel free to hit subscribe so you catch the videos. What did you think of this show compared to Season 1? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, thanks for tuning into the video and I'll see you in the next one.